Sexy businesses in Sacramento County. From somewhere deep in the cloud and the corners of the earth, this is the Killing It Podcast with a focus on helping you make sense and dollars of all things IT. With your hosts, Dave Sobel, Ryan Morris, and Carl Polichuk. Uh, many of you have been uh, fans of the Killing It podcast, and every once in a while we do a Killing It live edition. I want to thank Asigra uh, for making this possible, sponsoring our conference. Asigra is the leader in ultra-secure backup and recovery. Last month, Asigra was named to CRN Magazine's coolest data protection vendor list for 2023. Increase your profits and your client's security by engaging today at asigra.com. Welcome, everybody, to episode 204 of the Killing It podcast. So normally, Nye would have to, like, move those two on top of each other, but... You, nah, this, you get you get to lie. You get it live. You get to have you get us, and we're raring to go. Gents, I'm going to kick us off with the fun question of the day here. What's the most useless talent you have? I have to say, you're, you're probably never going to believe this. Okay. Pipe fitting. I I cut and sold pipe at a hardware store when I was a teenager. And to this day, if you need anybody to redo the plumbing in your house, I'm your guy. Believe it Dude, or not. I, I I literally might be buying you an airplane ticket some <laughs> bar, sometime soon because that would be radically cheaper than hiring the plumber to come in and actually do that repiping. And, and trust me, that's not something that a DIYer should be figuring out. Oh, because, well, I, I will say because, I don't own the equipment. <laughs> I will I will yeah. rent those tools from Home Depot for you. Exactly. Uh, I, I will say my 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 useless skill is is radically more useless um, than Carl's. I I I have juggling skills, Ooh. and and not just a little. Like when I was when I was a teenager, I worked in an environment where I had a lot of free time, and I had some baseballs that I was responsible for, and, and I would spend hours practicing juggling and uh I, I still can and i still do and believe me children are fascinated by this but other than that it, it provides absolutely no real purpose in the real world and yet i, I keep the skill right I, Sh sharon I, has I wanted me to practice. learn to juggle for years <laughs> like, like I, I, <laughs> and i don't know why like and I, I, don't, I completely refuse my my I, mine is so i am intensely fast at the at running a mcdonald's drive through <laughs> it's, in fact i have a record for like i could i did an entire order in three seconds because i was able to completely game the system from the start to end time of that so i'm incredibly fast at running a mcdonald's drive-thru so you have mad mcdonald's drive through exactly mad skills mad skills uh i, I guess <laughs> it, like it's a fallback <laughs> like it's i guess very good uh, so, Kinda hey, useless. folks, if you like our podcast, uh, if, you, if you haven't checked it out, go to killingit.smallbizthoughts.com or, or look for Killing It on all of your help, happy uh, podcast uh, podcatchers. Um, and, it, you know, if you like it, give us a review on Apple. It does help us out, and we I do appreciate it. And Carl was nice enough to leave the sponsorship slot for me, brought to you by the Business of Tech podcast. If you are not checking out my news podcast, please do. Every day, releasing the two to four stories that you need to know and answering the question, why do we care? Giving you some insight into the technology stories of the day through the minds of somebody delivering IT services. You can check it out at businessof.tech. There's a big blue button to get it on whatever format you like. It comes out now, not just in audio format, but you can get the video version every single day on the YouTube channel. All the, all the links at businessof.tech. All right, I'm going to jump us into topic number one, gents. <laughs> Shocking, it's AI, our first first show after a break, and we have to go in on AI because we have not dug in too much this. ChatGPT, now over 100 million users this week, debates in the Senate with Sam Altman sitting in front and taking questioning. This is the first round of multiple rounds lawmakers are talking about. In fact, they were talking about a digital agency to regulate this whole space, uh, and we're clearly past a hockey stick moment in terms of the tech. Uh, all right, where where are your heads at on this one? What where is the 
opportunity and how is it going to change our business in the next 12 months? What's interesting is that the the government is talking about regulating and they literally can't spell it. I mean, they they have no idea what it is. They couldn't define it for a million dollars in cash. Yeah, I, they just it's like, oh, but we should regulate that. You know, uh, they have some vague idea from the media, but uh, you know, I think that we need some education before we have regulation. Because uh, I well, all right, would- Carl, I'll, pu- I'll push back a little bit because they've been going through. There's there's an AI, an actual AI caucus that has now actually been running training programs for representatives to go and learn about this. You know, one of the local reps, congressional reps, literally went back to get his master's degree in AI in order to uh, in order to work on that at the congressional level. They've been doing a lot of training around this. I want to I want to I'm going to throw out because I've got a new one, uh, a new way of thinking on this, That because I think this is, is a big opportunity and how it's going to change our business is where we're applying these skills fundamentally, but the business underlying hasn't changed. I want to borrow a concept for, from uh, the guys over at the Tech Meme Ride Home, uh, which is another podcast I listen to. Uh, Brian McCullough and Chris Messina have put forth this idea that all of the various AI flavors out there are like the, the winemaking industry, that they're individual grapes and the models and the technologies are the various grapes and you will learn varietals and that will create different wines and different product sets based on the different models out there. That's their model. And I think I like like that because I think I've been thinking a lot about the fact that we need to learn the models and we need to learn the various uh, ways that they will affect and create products that are like the wines, because you can extend this perfectly. And what I've done a layer on top of this is saying, I think that makes IT services companies slash MSPs, whatever you want to call yourselves, sommeliers, the exact same space that you would be in terms of helping a customer apply technology to their needs is exactly what a sommelier does for why. And so it's exa- it does not change our core business at all about advising technology, but man, it makes it so much more complicated because, because the numbers of varietals and how fast they're coming and the way that you've got to come up to speed on that is crazy fast. See, now that's the key right there, Dave. Speed is the most important thing and speed ain't what the government is good at, right? Uh, I I heard some of the testimony and I I was encouraged by some of the commentary and some of the things that were going on. Uh, But uh, one of the good news things that I heard in their say was uh, maybe just an indication that some of these players, they admit that they blew it the last time around and they might be learning some lessons. Last time, meaning social media, right? Uh, They did not regulate, they did not get involved in the process. They just took that, well, I mean, it's new, let's wait and see what happens and eventually we'll figure it out. And by the time they tried to begin participating in the process, the, the meltdown of our culture and discourse had already been well underway. This time around, they're saying, okay, AI is new. Let's not wait for the bad stuff to happen. Let's try to get ahead of this and be proactive. Not not just like, you know, the the school principal who's going to whack you on the knuckles when you do something wrong, but maybe a guideline body, a shaping force that can make this stuff do good things and prevent bad things, right? Not just penalize people when they do things wrong. The problem that I have with this is speed. Again, uh, think about it this way. The the announcement this week that matters in the AI world is that chat GPT in the paid version is now available for uh, those users to apply to direct web queries. Uh, We all know that the original chat GPT was trained on the large language model on everything that had ever been published to the web right up until 2021. And then they stopped and they were training and learning and trying to prove out. And it's amazing the hallucinations that happened as a result of that gap in time. But now you can apply this stuff to real time. Okay, In in the evolution of product offers, that you see in technology worlds to get from this is an internal beta to this is a public uh, release for for candidate and then getting it into a version two version three that has radically advanced capabilities that takes years this has taken weeks 
And I can't imagine a government body that's going to be swift enough to make a meaningful contribution. But boy, I hope they prove me wrong because this has a lot of potential bad. Well, but to, Dave, to, to, I think you make notes. us sound way better. I Somehow, do have to yeah. say, having all of these 80-something-year-olds sitting around talking about large language models and unstructured data versus structured data, I just am not convinced that they're going to get it enough to, to make rational decisions, which gets us back to what you were saying about social media, where they basically, they invited the social media in and said, how would you guys regulate yourself? Do you know? <laughs> so, but, but the important part is that we are literally, we call it that hockey stick moment, right? We are there. Like this is one of the few times in my life, and this may be the only time in my lifetime where we're visibly seeing that hockey stick moment or that hockey stick second. I mean, it is AI is is this one singularity that uh, if all other technology begins to grow this fast, we are going to be very frightened of it. <laughs> right yeah, now, I'm not frightened of AI. I mean, you, but... you guys are probably a little bit more skeptical than I am, and I. I... I actually look at this and sort of say, like, I think there's, I think they've got a pretty reasonable shot at getting some basic frameworks. On. When, when I look at the AI framework coming out of the White House, when I look at the ones put together by the Pentagon, like they're they're actually pretty smart. And and what's interesting to me when I listen to some of the hearing stuff from from this week was how like hand wavy the stuff from Sam Altman is. Like he wants you to 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 worry about the existential threats where which is which is actually like a bit of a head fake of where we actually ought to talk about is is the like okay what do we mean about like what do we have to reskill people what do we have to do in terms of what this means to the workforce impact and i'm not saying cuz I, I said this before i don't i'm not in the business of protecting jobs i'm in the business of protecting people and so but what do we have to do in order to help there and I think that is an area where they they have proven they can do stuff. Um, and by the way, let's, you know, like, you know, I'm going to throw out the kind of nugget of, of knowledge of things that have, the U.S. Digital Service, which is literally their own consulting group, built their own tax processing product, which they are putting out into beta, beta and it actually looks like it works pretty well. Like they have a, they have a whole team of these people and they hire tech savvy people to work in these agencies so so don't don't necessarily be completely dismissive of their ability to do something here well just one quick observation even if they can do well i agree with you dave we need to make sure we're focused on what matters long before ai threatens the survival of humanity it can cause bad consequences in terms of you know like let's you let's do a, a deep fake of the weekend and release a song in his voice and and call it oh hey it's new music from that you know what all of that artistic control and copyright and trademark that's going to be an, a consequence in a, an hour and a half from now not at the end of civilization so let's make sure they're focused on the right things. All right, topic number two. So this is what we always do. We can never finish a, a, a topic, so we have to just interrupt. Nope, got to move on. <laughs> topic number two, in case you're unaware of it, Ryan's favorite movie of all time, which he can't, literally can't do three shows without mentioning, is Minority Report. And, and now I was like, oh, dear God, this can't be true. So they've taken these mice and forced them to watch a movie and recorded their brainwaves, and then took the mice's brain waves and used it to recreate the movie. And it's like, oh God, this can't be real. See, Three now, not are only, here. <laughs> I know, exactly. Not only could this be real, unfortunately, in the spirit of the pharmaceutical industry and the way that they prove out treatment methodologies before they test them on humans, this is a proven pathway to a product that will eventually reach the real world. Now, I'm still suspect of some of the capabilities of AI and, and machine learning and the ability to create new ideas as opposed to just mimic the ideas that have already existed. But uh, the world doesn't actually need a psychic precog to predict the future. What we need is pattern recognition, literally, right? Like the, the essence of that predictive accuracy and what gives you the ability to say what's about to happen, it takes a very rare black swan moment to break out of 
patterns of past behavior. So uh, now what I will say, if you notice, Steve, I'm already participating in the minority report with my AirPod. Uh, you will recognize that communication technology from the movie and all, uh, everything except for precogs and a really legitimately autonomous vehicles. Everything else in the movie has come true. All of those technologies are out there productized right now, uh, including retina scans and personalizing advertising messages and biometrics and everything. It's all coming. Uh, I, I read this story, Carl, and, and I was half excited and half completely freaked out because I've seen enough times that movie to know that the space between when the technology is available and when we get control, some bad shit happens. Yeah, and, okay. and the next chapter might not be good. All right, but but I want to make I want to make two statements on that and then a broader one. So so the first off is is movies about only nice things happening are boring. That's why they don't put them out, right? Okay, so so like if we put out a movie about how the technology just rolls forward and everyone's life got a little bit better, uh, that would be boring because you need conflict for good storytelling, right? So let let's acknowledge that that pulling all of our ideas from movies is has this downside because of the second downside. And this is where I'm going to get a little bit more serious on this. Humans are wired to see the negatives in things first, because it's a protective instinct to recognize something as if it is a danger and understand what the dangers are there so that I can then react to them if they are coming for me. Think back to prehistoric times when you're running around and you see a, a new animal. You want to understand all of the ways it might eat you before the ways it might be your friend. <laughs> like that, that is that is literally just an instinctive piece. So it's very easy for us to think about the bad things. That's not a bad thing. But what I'm also observing is that it is difficult to see all of the good changes, right? For every major technology, we spend a lot of time thinking about all of the bad things that have come. come. But what I also want to say is, is that we've also can look at computers as they are creative tools. They have always been creative tools. And our line of new creative tools just continues to get larger and larger. I am very much looking forward to seeing all of the things I can't even dream up of how artists and creatives will create more things with this while also processing the fact that I do want to take into account that there are the bad things of that. Those are the things that come into, into play. But know that we're just bad at seeing the good stuff because we're not wired to see that. I, what's interesting is I take the exact opposite point of view. I think human beings have this bias towards positivity. I, you know, uh, if, if people did not have faith in the future, they wouldn't have children. Right. Uh, you know, human beings tend to look at things. And, and I have to say my bias, I love technology and I believe it will solve all of our problems. We just have to, you know, release the Kraken. Right. So um, I do think in this particular case, this idea that we can look at brain waves and turn it into, you know, some understanding of what was actually seen and so forth uh, can be huge. There's a whole lot of people who have issues that the medical community is now going to be able to look at and say, oh, we can help them with uh, cognition and so forth. Um, and so you know, there's, I think there's always great opportunity. The, the main thing is in this case is that somebody came up with something that is so bizarre and said, hey, you know, can I get just enough funding to see whether or not this is true? And I'm grateful that we actually uh, are able to fund projects like this that to me, I would say that just sounds like a silly movie. I remain open to the idea of a colander on my head. I draw the line at things going into my brain. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to continue to hold that line on. I, I've written software. I, I understand the difference. <laughs> I will be first to have the implant. There's no question. Like, you can see, try it out, sir. Report back because, <laughs> because see, this, this is the thing, right? <laughs> what we're, what we're seeing and, you know, all, all of our humor and, and, uh, and movie critique aside, this technology is fascinating. The fact that you can measure the electrical impulses and identify thought patterns, it's a question of correlation, right? It's not just that you saw the pattern of electrical firing that happened and you could say, well, this was a pattern one, two, three, four, right? It was, no, no, they saw a stimulus input and they 
did something as a result of that. And I can correlate the cause and effect with a pattern of information processing. That's literally what we do on server uh, processing on silicon, on silicon chips, right? If I can say that correctly. Uh, that's literally what we do with technology is it's pattern recognition and a bunch of ones and zeros. If you can apply that to the complexity, the gajillions of data points of thought in one brain, another brain, another brain, et cetera, holy cow, that has some really fascinating capabilities. I just want to be the guy who sells the data storage infrastructure behind this technology, because uh, if you think that autonomous cars produce a lot of data as they're out there observing the world and that needs to be stored somewhere, imagine the gajillion terabytes that are going to come from mapping people's minds, because I don't know about you guys, just in the last 10 minutes, I've had like 11 other thoughts about cool ways to use this technology. My brain's going that fast. I'm sure yours is as well. And everybody in the audience, small uh, USB stick that by, for this. Small yeah, USB multiply stick that by 330 it. million Americans. Then I, I want to be the guy who has the contract for selling the data storage. So, so I'm going to throw out another little weird twist on this because I'm going to link it to, to actually like the story we're not going to cover as much because I'm fascinated by interfaces, right? And I, I continue to maintain I'm not wrong on voice. It's just hasn't happened yet. But but the one that saw that I saw recently is Google's project Game Face came out last week. If you didn't see this open source project, it's really intriguing. They've actually they are now using just webcams can map the entire tracking of someone's face, and they're using it as an input device for gaming. Uh, and so, and it's fascinating because they've released the whole thing open source so that people can work on it. And the idea is, is those with disabilities can interact with with the with the computer in new ways by moving their face. It's interesting to me the fact that you that, that there is an ability not just to like read things from your brain, but we're experimenting with more and more of these interesting ways to control the machines that we interact with. We could think them, we could see them, we could talk to them, it could recognize that, we could get into the whole facial recognition piece. That whole space is advancing incredibly fast. And you know, if you if you if you want to see a positive version of this, you know, I've thought it out there before the Star Trek computer, right? The one that you can talk to that also seems to have other awarenesses. That if you think it through, it's clearly using facial recognition, positioning recognition. We could see a new paradigm of interfaces become available by the combination of these technologies. And uh, final note before we move on. Last year, a lot of people may have missed this, but we re-sequenced the human genome, right? Because the first time we did it, our technology was here by today's standards, and that technology has grown exponentially. And so now we have a much fuller understanding. So things like this, where we have an interface to the brain, uh, are going to explode. I mean, it will be a growth industry for the next five years. All right, guys, topic number three for us. I want to in the spirit of tech optimism versus pessimism, apparently some people who do this for a living have some irrational optimism and the the uh, the money to put into the investments in what seems like cool technology that just absolutely positively never pays off. Specifically, I'm referring to the death announcement of uh, the metaverse, capital M metaverse, right? Uh, if you guys were familiar with the, the developments in the story, uh, just last week in their earnings call, when when uh, Mark Zuckerberg got on the call, talked to the analysts, talked to the investors uh, for Meta as an organization, um, he he spent a whole lot of time talking about AI. He spent a whole lot of time talking about uh, the advertising business again. He spent a whole lot of time talking about his year of, of stability and predictability in business finances. But you know what he didn't talk about? That great big hole over there in his PL where he shovels billions of dollars for this thing called the metaverse. Uh, apparently, Mark thinks that that is dead technology. What do you guys think about the metaverse? And is it dead? Is it something that is ever going to become a thing? All right. Go ahead, Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I just going to say, I, I think that this is one of these cases where just because technology exists doesn't mean it has to dominate or be big or, or you know, whatever, control the world. I think, as we've talked many times, augmented reality, I think that's our future. Specific things where I need a headset, that might be part of the future. Uh, I think that learning all of this, it's, it's kind of like the space race. Spending all the billions of dollars of, of uh, Zuckerberg's money uh, is going to advance technology and make our lives better, but not with the headset, you know. So it's just it'll it'll help us with other things. And I don't know if you've seen that now they have these submarines where they put the drone submarine down and the guy's looking in his goggles because he's got to be able to see only what the sub is seeing and so forth. And, and you know, they're using these in documentaries now. There is a place for it. Um, and surgery, remote surgery and so forth. Like there's lots of great use cases. Uh, I'm not sure video games is the use case. Hey, remember, video games bigger than most of the entertain all of the other entertainment sp spaces entirely. So don't diss on us gamers. Oh yeah, I get that. Uh, the whole Microsoft <laughs> acquisition going on in my head. So, but so so we as an industry, we love our shiny things, right? Most of us got into technology because we do like the gadgets and the gizmos, and we like the kinds of stuff that we can do with it. And we are very enamored with our own PR. Uh, every let's go with nine months or so, we are all chasing the next big thing. Everything is the biggest, greatest thing ever. Uh, and I think we're, we need to be very much careful about looking at adoption numbers and actually ensuring that things solve real world problems. It is okay to solve small real world problems with technology. Uh, you know, do do I think everyone's going to have a headset? No, because I think that that's a bad idea. And if people like talking to one another and looking at one another. Uh, and I think with the moment you strap the thing on your face, uh, you look like a goober. Uh, but do I think that there will be specific instances that are useful? Yeah, okay, sure. Do I think it was a wise business choice to dump a big much, bunch of money? No, but I said so before. <laughs> you know, but he didn't ask me either. Right. Now, we, well, the, the, the bit I want to focus on for us in the technology space is that we need to be good skeptics on behalf of our customers, that you want to look at these and say, what problem is this solving? And does it apply to all my customers, a subset of my customers, specific customers? And you want to be much more willing to be skeptical of every one of these fads. ChatGPT kind of escaped. Like it, it was, it was a, something that they put out that they didn't think was a thing and it took off. That wasn't a planned thing. It kind of just accidentally happened because it showed more usefulness than the designers thought. Anytime a technology that says can solve everything, it probably doesn't do any of them particularly well. There's a long list of dud technologies that we've talked about. Anybody remember big data? How about let's talk about 3D printing? Let's talk about, you know, like there's a whole list of all these but by the way, I literally just was interviewing somebody over on Business of Tech who literally told me that, oh, yeah, but I can give you specific use cases for 3D printing, for big data, for like there are each of those have usefulness. We as the IT services organizations need to have a much healthier skepticism for this and push back on behalf of our customers, get excited about stuff, but be practical about where it applies. I thought a big metaverse bet was a bad idea. But I don't own Facebook stock either. <laughs> well, and I think also everything, if it is successful, it has its time period. There was a time when knowing a great deal about modems made me a bunch of money, right? <laughs> you know, there was a time when every client needed a scanner. Uh, and then two years later, every client had a scanner and they had a bunch of crap on top of it because they haven't used that scanner in, in two years, right? So, you know, the, everything comes and goes. Uh, and if it only helps us get to the next step, then uh, the metaverse is a good thing. But uh, I, I do think it's got a place. Uh, and I do think there'll be a bunch of money. In it. And I think when everybody's done laughing, Zuckerberg is going to be the front runner on all those technologies because he doubled down on something everybody else was going to not pay much attention to. The, uh, and I, 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 I think the dud is still will, dud. <laughs> well, and, and I will say, uh, in the strictest case of ROI calculations, I'm not sure if Mark will ever make back all the money that he shoveled into this thing. 
but there will be practical applications in a in a real world sense. I think that's a good way to describe the most essential skill that a technology solution provider has. It, it's not ones and zeros, and it's not tech administration and managed services. Our most essential skills is the ability to translate the possibility of technology into a tangible use case, right? Your ability to say, hey, this is your world as you currently live it and understand it. Here's something that's not good about that world. And what if it was improved in a measurable, meaningful way? That's a practical application of technology. Uh, in very much the same way that electricity is a technology and it, well, what's the purpose of electricity? Uh, shocking things is not a very good use case, but there are 18 million other use cases that once we saw it, we went, oh, wait, now I see why this stuff is going to be practical. It will never not be humorous that Mark went so far into this thing that he literally renamed his company because he was so delusionally convinced it was going to be the immediate future that he stopped being one thing and started being another. But even inside his application right now, uh, the funniest data point about this entire thing that I heard was that last month in the month of April, MySpace yeah. had more active users than Horizon Worlds did. And that is, if you are involved in the Horizon Worlds world, y'all ought to go home and have a glass of wine and reconsider your decision-making processes because you're not winning in the practical sense. But I'll go exactly where Carl is. I think in an industrial sense, in a practical um, exploration sense, in a physical world, you are going to find a lot of very valuable use cases for augmented reality. It, it won't be instead of real life, the way that Mark kind of put the business case together, it will be a way to get your job done much more effectively. And we are seeing in the industrial world of technology, right? Manufacturing, automation, logistics, distribution, the things that industry does, there are very valuable applications of even a headset. And don't forget, it's only going to be a couple of days from right now when Apple comes into this conversation and releases what we're all suspecting is going to be their a uh, their AR goggles or headset. And you know, you remember how everybody said tablets will never be a thing because everybody tried tablets, and then the iPad came out, and everybody went, "Oh, well, wait." The reason that tablets weren't a thing before is that all those other ones sucked. And then the iPad was graceful and it was cool and it was smooth. And then it became a category. I'm, I'm not going to really say that augmented reality and goggle world is dead until I see whether or not the Apple guys can make a legit go at it because they tend to do things. The rest of us only wish we could. All right, so, I, so I, will, I will say the goggles are stupid and it's not going to be a thing. I'm going to draw the AR line <laughs> and thing on your face and not thing on your face. Okay. And I'm just going to make my last point of like, I don't see the goggles, but I see anything that is projection that is uh, real world simulation that is AR without the thing on your face. That will be where this goes. Very good. And that, my friends, will do it for episode 204 of the Killing It, Killing it. Killing it. podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Killing It podcast. Please share with your friends and tell everyone to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all the podcast places. Join us next week and help us keep killing it in the technology business.